like to uh, welcome our first speaker, who is Andrew Strumer from Airbus Defence and Space. Uh, Andy has over 30 years' experience in the space industry, working for Airbus Defence and Space in satellites and related service businesses. Uh, he was, he's contributed to the Skynet, Skynet 5 programme. He was UK MD at Astrium Geo Information Services Division and he rejoined Astrium Satellites in 2012 as the UK National Director for Earth Observation, Navigation and Science Division and he's now taken on additional responsibility as Stevenage Site Director in 2014. So can we provide a big sun welcome for Andy Struman? Lucy. Um, it's really great to be here actually. I think we've all, a number of us um, industry or industrialists in the room, uh, have got a lot of challenges and I think we're increasingly, along with a number of others, looking for the young generation to really help us with those challenges. So it's something we're putting a lot of focus into and, and it's a really welcome opportunity to talk to this group about, uh, from our perspective, what, what we're really looking for. I think... Um, I mean, I say do have the opportunity to talk to our graduates quite a bit at work, and I reinforce the message to them. I think they're really at the change of generations in, in the space industry and our business. When you think about you know, my generation, which is uh, sadly getting a bit old now, but you know, that was the point at which we were taking the space industry from a kind of prototyping to at least a repeatable production-type industry. Um, and now we've got another generation which is really taking us forward into the applications world, into the conservation world, into the new space world. So there is really a, you know, a change in mindset for the whole industry, I think, and that's what we're looking for this next generation to really push forward with that. Um, I'll spare you the marketing speak because I couldn't, I was a bit late to, to create another slide, but just to really illustrate the point, you know, it, it, space is a big business. In, in Airbus, we do you know, a lot right the way across the value chain from equipment through to uh, launch services, through to satellite priming, through to value-added services. And that's not that's something just to, just to flag the business, but that's just illustrative of the different needs we have for graduates and other young people coming into the business. We're looking to serve all those needs which are quite different. I'm sure you'll appreciate from, from the guy who can design a digital processor right up to the person who can think about the next innovative constellation idea and you'll see that kind of reflected in the rest of the presentation. If I just uh, again just really quickly take that through into the UK, um, again similar story, we've got quite a diverse set of activities uh, across the UK so if we collected all the Airbus space activities it's about a billion pound turnover business so you know, quite substantial but a nice balance, balance in two respects. One between the institutional business coming from UK institutions, but more particularly from, from ESA, uh, balanced with the commercial export activity, which is aligned to our commercial telecoms um, business. And then the other balance we've got is really between the infrastructure building activity, so satellites and, and, and ground segment infrastructure, to value added services. Um, so putting those two together gives us a nice kind of rounded feel to the business in the UK. But for the purposes of this, you know, it's really about trying to get the right kind of people in who can not only deal with the breadth of things we have to offer, but increasingly what we want is people can move from one part of the business to another. That's how we're building our, our high caliber managers, the fact they've got a background in these different parts of the business in the UK and across Europe. So, okay, so um, focusing down a bit more, uh, a bit of data. So I was going to apologise to the HR professionals in the room. So this is an HR-generated slide, which means the messages are really good and strong, but the numbers don't always add up in quite the right way. So those of you who've got your calculators out, um, we'll go through the rationale, because uh, there are some parts of this which are uh, applied to, to different elements. So um, just really take the top-down messages. So first of all... Um, we're lucky enough to get a very high proportion of applications for our graduate positions, and that is growing year on year. So we're around you know, under 6,000 in 2015, up to nearly 8,000 in 2017. 
And if you look beyond the data, you know, it was roughly, say, in 2015, close to 6,000 applicants for around 20 positions. We're really increasing the number of positions recently. So our um, 8,000 applicants this year was for about 50 uh, positions. So still a very healthy ratio of, of applications to positions. Uh, but as you'll see, you know, we, we really need that, that volume and the quality of applications to, to get what we want. I thought I'd flag up diversity as well. So we're looking at diversity, again, a very conscious, top-down uh, management focus right the way across Europe and the UK. So I picked out gender diversity here because it tends to be the first thing people look at, but I mean, other aspects of diversity are important for us as well. So, you know, we are, again, uh, I think, uh, constructively increasing the percentage of female applicants year on year. So we're now about 20% applicants. And we are over recruiting if you like you know our um not not by way of um uh, bias if you like we're not actively biasing the recruitment but i think the quality of the female applicants may be coming through and so we're actually again increasing year on year the proportion of offers we're making to, to female applicants but you know i think we're all conscious and um, we'd like to do more here and uh, we'd certainly like to see that increasing further still and not really for this room, but then we have another challenge of really bringing through uh, the female offers to, to get them to positions in, in the management boards, because that's still where you know, we are weak across the business in having uh, women in those senior positions. But you know, there's, there's, um, there's, there's reason for optimism here in terms of the way uh, those applications are coming through. Uh, so the other thing for us, you know, we are a European company and we are recruiting globally. So in 122 different nationalities represented in those uh, close to 8,000 offers. So I wasn't even sure there were 122 nationalities, to be honest. But, but at least, uh, you know, we're getting a real variety and a real um, uh, variety of people to, to select from, from that, from that point of view. Um, the next one's quite interesting as well. And I'll, I'll, talk about it a bit more when we come to the specifics of, of this year's needs and that's the, um, the kind of focus of the role so certainly if you look at 2016-2015 uh, we probably had the heaviest focus of recruitment and the heaviest interest from our applicants in what I would call the classical role so mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, propulsion engineering and so on so Stephen Lee particularly you know, that's where we do our mechanical um, disciplines for the commercial export business so that's tended to be strong. So when we come to, to nowadays, um, we're seeing a slight shift of roles. And you'll see later on, you know, we're shifting to this new space business where we're looking at different kinds of roles. And I think that's also reflected in the, the interest of the applicants that we're getting. So you know, people are interested in the wider aspects of systems engineering, business engineering, and uh, you know, the, the most popular um, vacancy we had this year was something called a space vehicle architect so I'm not entirely sure what that is but it's clearly a system level you know, system level view of what's happening in the industry and, and quite appealing to, to the people who are applying to us um, so just to explain the kind of process we go through so we get all these applications and then we have a second tier um, wave of processing the applications through an online test um, and uh, you can see we've probably had some different things happening in the tests uh, this year compared to previous years. So it looks like the test has gone a bit tougher and also the number of people actually progressing from making an application to going through into the test is increasing. So again, it's a positive sign. We're getting, we're getting applications, but we're also getting traction from people who are interested to carry the process further forwards. So we go through the, um, the test and then we invite uh, a number of people to our assessment centres. So roughly you know, we're growing the number of people who are going to the assessment centres in, in a line with the number of vacancies that we've got. So we are in the end really selecting our 50-ish from a, a final deselected population of about 250, 300 people. So it's quite a rigorous process and you know, we're really looking for some strong uh, candidates and, and I'll just really try to illustrate for you some of the other things that we're looking for beyond pure academic ability. So these are the typical graduate qualifications that we've uh, that we've had uh, that we continue to look for. So 
you know, the majority of those are pretty classical, I think, when you, when you look at the courses and the universities we're interest, interfacing with. So aerospace, space technology, aeronautics, so pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, aviation safety, maybe a little bit of a swing on that. Um, again, the basics coming back to the core engineering disciplines in electrical and mechanical, and some um, natural sciences, physics is, um, is a, quite a good thing for us in terms of the future concepts, particularly for the, um, for the ESA institutional missions. Um, but I think the last few there are getting quite interesting as well. So, you know, as well as the aerospace disciplines, the pure science disciplines, we're looking at computing and networking, we're looking at telecoms, we're looking at industrialization engineering. So, you know, that's aligned, I think, with the, where the market's going in terms of this new space constellation business. And we're looking to really make sure we're staffing up to, um, uh, to, to help drive that. Just to pin that down for us, so I mentioned about, about 50 odd positions this year, this is how they're split out. So just to um, you know, just sort of reinforce, so if I looked at the uh, mechanical thermal, for example, 10 positions together with the electrical digital, which is the more hardware orientated um, electrical disciplines, another five there, and avionics software functional verification of the 12, so you've got you know, roughly half of the population there in what I call the classical areas uh, and then on top of that we've got networks and ground systems, we've got systems engineering which encompasses also applications and solutions um, and then the dark side of project management, marketing, bids and commercial and so on. So, so pretty rounded but I'd say you know, an increasing mix of the core classical disciplines which we absolutely still need, we need to you know, have our uh, basics of our mechanical engineering, electrical engineering rock solid but we're looking for people who can also develop that in a, in a wider sense uh, through these different roles. So and that's the, that's the, um, the range of uh, vacancies that we've got and the range of um, people that we're looking at uh, this year. Okay, so just, just beyond the uh, kind of 50 odd positions that we're looking for, I think it's, it's worthwhile you know, drilling down into that a little bit more. So, uh, as I said, the core engineering disciplines are absolutely relevant and um, the moves of the market towards applications, towards new space, absolutely we're looking to align with that. And when you look at the kind of expertise and the people that can help with that, you know, things like big data management, things like really thinking about um, innovative business cases, about you know, entrepreneurial ways of exploiting the value chain and so on, uh, those are the kind of qualities we're looking for, not necessarily with graduates straight out of university, but at least having the ability to grow into that kind of capability and that kind of skills. So we, when we look at our graduates, we're really looking at two, predominantly two career paths for them. We're either saying, you know, these guys are going to be grown to be technical specialists, so really, you know, if we can, looking for real world leaders in some of the core technologies we've got. Uh, in the UK, so in propulsion, in structures, in uh, digital processing, in antennas. And we're really looking for the depth of people who can become, follow a technical career path and become real technical experts. Or we're looking for people who are able to take a solid technical base, but then go into the management skills. So you know, lead wider businesses, lead teams, lead uh, projects. And we offer you know, our graduates the opportunity to follow those two paths uh, as they progress off the graduate scheme. Um, increasingly sort of looking for softer skills uh, around our graduates that can make a big difference to you know, the people we're taking on. So not only the technical competence needs to be there but the, the classical soft skills, leadership, communications, uh, problem solving, uh, everything we do is about working in a team and you know, we want people who have demonstrated that ability. Uh, we want people, even if they're real technical engineers, <coughs> to have a business and commercial sense about what's going on. Because when they come to uh, build the thermal subsystem on solar orbiter, we want them to drive the supply chain, we want to drive business efficiencies while they're actually doing the technical job. So we want the confidence in people that they're able to, um, to deliver that. Um, Languages, I mean, it's, um, I think we're again we're very lucky uh, from the UK, business languages, English, everybody works in English, it's all fine, you can, you can absolutely get by. 
Um, but I'd say, you know, we are a global business. We're based in Europe. If you can speak a foreign language, that's a big asset. And um, particularly, I've, I've put down the bottom there. And increasingly for us, um, you know, we want everybody to be able to act globally. And the more you can speak languages, the, the better for that. But we also want a few people who are prepared to actually live globally. So we want people to come and say, right, I'm going to build my career in Munich or Toulouse or Los Angeles or wherever. And uh, we want them to be the representatives abroad so that we have an international business that's staffed with UK people in senior management positions. And you only do that in the big transnational companies by uh, going abroad, spending time abroad, uh, spending time in, in these different cultures. So, you know, it's, um, it's a good thing to have for everybody, but for the real people who want to build an international career, you know, we really want to have... I think even more of a focus on international business and being able to sustain that uh, living out of the UK. Okay, so what are we doing? I mentioned, you know, it is, it is a really big topic for us, uh, early careers of all sorts. So you know, we're really looking at everything from a STEM centre that you may have seen we put uh, alongside our Mars Yard test facility, getting school kids in and getting them interested through our apprentice scheme and revamping those, uh, and uh, also importantly into the graduate scheme. So we really want this early careers part to, to really work for us um, more positively, I would say, than it's done over the, over the last five to 10 years. So you know, we've got uh, a strong management emphasis now on recruiting um, and retaining, and uh, also importantly, the best graduates. And best doesn't necessarily mean the most academically gifted. You know, I mentioned all those things we're looking for. Don't necessarily need guys who are you know, absolutely in all roles, the top of their technical abilities, but we want this kind of rounded uh, capability to be able to work in the same world that we work in. So we put a lot of effort in updating our, our graduate schemes and there's more detail available on that in terms of making sure that when we've recruited these guys, they get a good process into the company and we're able to keep them in good jobs uh, once they um, exit our graduate scheme. Um, on, the, on the previous, uh, on the chart with all the numbers, there was also a line at the bottom which was um, graduates from internships. And that's still quite low for me when I look at that and in terms of the business head on. Uh, I think internships are a really good way of you know, the candidates getting to know the business before they come to us and us getting to know the candidates. So one of the things, again, we want to work on more is being having that um, knowledge build between the individual and the company over a period of time. And to do that, to help do that, uh, we work with the Airbus uh, Universities Partnership and um, we have campus ambassadors. I think with the SOM network, we really like to extend that and continue to work with that because um, it's a big part, not just of the defence and space part and space part particularly, but for the Airbus group in general. So that's given you something of a feel for, for our priorities and how we go about it. So I guess we'll have a Q&A later on. Happy to, to discuss at that point. <coughs> Thank you very much, Andy.